They didn't make it up. Huh? Good morning. Please get your authorized version of the scripture. Don't chill. I'm using two sets of scriptures. We're going to be going to be doing a bit of expository this morning. Just a bit. Okay, not anything too in depth like it has been done before, but um going to be answering a question um, about John chapter 8. We are going to be reading John chapter 8 verses 1 on to verse 11 and we're going to be doing some expository things here within what we are looking at, okay? That's why you see me having two sets of scriptures, my Cambridge and my Oxford, okay? Oh, and this is the Oxford 1917 edition, okay? Which does not have the changes like the uh, Schofield 3 Steady Bible, okay? Uh, the Schofield 3 Steady Bibles, those you do not want to get because they openly in the preface and whatnot, they say that they change certain words within the text. The 1917 edition, which is this one right here, um, the text of Scripture is fine, okay? A pure Cambridge edition, you could say, comparable onto it. Okay, and this, my Cambridge, of course, is a pure Cambridge edition. Uh, I am a proponent for the pure Cambridge edition because it has all the proper things in it, all the proper pronunciations. I know Mr. Smiley, not the guy from Canada, but I know Mr. Smiley, uh, David Daniels, who uh, only gets mad at true, uh, truly saved brethren of the church, a living God. <laughs> um, I know that he said I'll never use a pure Cambridge edition, okay? That's that's just me, okay? But anyway, enough of that. We're going to be reading in John chapter 8 verses 11 uh, verses 1 on to verse 11, okay? Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Follow me along, okay? You got to pause the video, pause it. You want to get two sets of scriptures like I do? Go ahead, okay? But follow me along in the scriptures, okay? All right, and I'm going to talk to you like you are. Follow me along in the scriptures, okay? All right. Yes, the question that I was asked was, did these guys make it up about the woman in adultery? We're going to look at that. And also going to answer some other several things, okay? This is not as organized as some of the videos that I've done in expository before, but, all right. John chapter 8, verses 1 on 2, verse 11. We begin. Ah, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. Now, before we continue, adultery is listed here. Adultery. Not fornication. Okay? Because uh, in argument, you know, trying, you know, not to be debating, but, you know, um, well, what's the difference between adultery and fornication and that kind of stuff? The text here says adultery, okay? And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Okay. Now, first of all, what is going on here? What is going on here? Okay. Psalm 9. Psalm 9, verses 16 and 17. Okay. Psalm 9, verses 16 and 17. Follow me along. Okay? The Lord is known by the judgment 
which he executeth. God is known by his judgment. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands, Higieon, Shilah. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Verse 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higieon, Selah. Okay? Go to Psalm 64. Psalm 64. Psalm 64. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked. From the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, like these scribes and Pharisees. Set a trap. Who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him, and fear not. These are also tactics of virtually all these lost devils, especially here on YouTube, and that you will meet some of their tactics that they employ. They set traps, trying to catch people. Okay? Be aware of that. For example, okay? For example... Some of these people who are brethren working for the Jesuit order, coadjutors, will send uh, will send somebody to start a to start something, and then one will come up to follow up that individual who started the initial whatever, and then another will come. See, they work in tandem, backing up each other. Okay, that's the way they work. Okay, like there's a guy who's from England, um, not my dear friend from Blackpool. <coughs> Pick your pardon. Beg your pardon. Yeah, not not him. But there's a guy from England who keeps sending me things. I just recently uh, saw in my uh, <laughs> uh, spam folder, which all your emails go to. They're different. Um, who was part of a trap that these coadjutors a while ago tried to spring on me or something like that uh, through this one guy from England. This other guy who's uh, um, teaches that God's love is unconditional. And stuff like that. And everybody's going to be saved. And then, of course, followed up by my dear friend from Blackpool, England. Okay? They set, they work in tandems. Okay? That's what they do. Verse 4 in Psalm 64. That they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares privily. They say, who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. Both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. They try to dredge up anything they can find, whatever it is, that they may use it as a means of attack against those who are of the church of the living God. Just like they did here to our Lord Jesus Christ. They engaged, uh, arranged the setup with this woman to trap him, okay? Because yes, and we'll, we'll look at this. Under the law, this, this woman who was caught and uh, taken in the very act of adultery deserved to die. Uh, where was the dude, by the way? Where was the guy at? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Verse seven. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. So they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. And all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God. For they shall wisely consider of his doing. Wisely consider of his doing. Remember that. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord. And shall trust in him. And all the upright in heart shall glory. Now, Psalm 140, Psalm 140, 
verses 1 on to verse 5. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man. These men were evil. Trying to trick, trying to snare, trying to trap our Lord. God the Father! Okay? They're trying to trap God the Father. <laughs> wow! Okay? These people were evil. These, these guys, these Pharisees and Sadducees, they were evil. And they were also violent because... They, wanted, they were saying, well, the law said we we're supposed to stone her. They really wanted to stone Jesus instead. That's what they really wanted to do. Violence was in their heart against the Lord. And they concocted this thing with this woman taken in adultery. Okay? So, so these men who did these, this, these scribes and Pharisees, they were evil and violent men. They had violence on the mind which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. Always, always fighting, always debating, always causing friction and tension, reveling in conflict, reveling in strife, reveling in contention. That's what these coadjutors do. That's what these devils do. They enjoy causing ripples in the water. They enjoy lighting fires and watching them burn. That's what they do. That's what they do, people. Okay? They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent <laughs> who is more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. You know, the devil, Satan. Adder's poison is under their lips. Shelah. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked, preserve me from the violent man who have proposed to overthrow my goings. The proud have hit a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. Shilah. Verse 4. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have proposed to overthrow my goings. These Jesuit coadjutors are sworn enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his word, the authorized version of the scriptures. Okay? They, they pretend that they believe in the authorized version of the scriptures, that they trust in the scriptures. They do not. Okay? But these people, okay, these people who have proposed to overthrow my goings. I've heard many people say that uh, about these devil coadjutors who work for the Vatican. I've heard people say, you know, you need to get a life. We have to understand, people. These devil coadjutors who all they do is attack and send out threats and stuff, that is their life. They have proposed, they have pro proposed to overthrow my goings, but also the goings of the Church of the Living God. That is their life. To be a snare. To be a trap. That is their purpose in life. That's all they're good for. They're not good for anything else. They're just there to cause division. To cause strife. As these guys were here. Setting traps. For our Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately. To see how he would respond. Because if he said something different. Right? But see, what our Lord does is he gets right to the heart of the matter. He cuts away everything off that flank and goes right to it. Okay? But now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. It was a setup. It was a setup. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 25 on to verse 29. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 25 on to verse 29. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found 
wicked men. They lay wait as he that set a snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As what the scribes, the Pharisees and scribes were doing with this woman taken in adultery. That's what these guys were doing. They were wicked men laying wait and setting snares, trying to catch our Lord. These people, these coadjutors, these devils, okay? They lay wait. They lay snares. They, caught, they set traps. They want to catch people. They're evil, okay? Evil and violent men. They're evil because they serve Satan, the Vatican. They're violent because if they had the chance, they would kill any one of us of the Church of the Living God. <laughs> and you want to join that, huh? They're boy. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Hope you have fun. Yeah. Let's continue. Verse 27. As a cage is full of birds. And in the book of Revelation, I believe it is chapter 18, that uh, Mystery Babylon, the great Roman Catholicism, is likened unto uh, a place where is a hold of every unclean and foul bird. Hmm? As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and waxen rich. Oh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they loved mammon. They served mammon. Okay, our Lord Jesus Christ points that out many a time within the scriptures about the uh, Pharisees and scribes. Okay, they elevated tradition over the scriptures which is what Catholics do, okay? They love the praises of men more than the praise of God, which Catholics do, okay? They, they make long prayers to be seen of men, like Catholics do, okay? They love money, like Catholics do. And the scribes and the Pharisees, oh, they were very wealthy. They were the upper echelon, but yet, they were, caught, they were set in snares, trying to catch and snare our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think they didn't know who they were dealing with? <laughs> yeah. Verse 28. They are waxen fat. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the judge of the and the the right of the needy do they not judge? Shall I not visit for these things? Saith the Lord, and there God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, was right there. Yeah. Shall I not visit for these things? Saith the Lord. Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? But yet, see, he's still fair just and equal. He had to first offer the kingdom of heaven unto his people, knowing that, the, he would, that they would reject it. But shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Okay? And now Lamentations, chapter 4. Lamentations, chapter 4. Lamentations, chapter 4, verses 8 and 19. If my fingers would cooperate... And the uh, pages are stuck together. There we go. <laughs> okay. Lamentations chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Indicative to every single devil, Jesuit, satanic, Roman Catholic coadjutor out there. They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled. For our end has come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. And that's what they do. They hunt our steps. Absolutely. They hunt our steps. Just like the example given of the Pharisees and scribes right here. Okay? Let's reread this. Okay? Beginning at verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. It specifically says adultery. 
Okay? Was this woman married? We do not know. Was the man, because in order to be adultery, okay, there had to be a man there, okay? Was the man married? We don't know, because we don't see anything mentioned about the man, do we? But let's read. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. It was taken in the very act. How did they do that? Unless they, unless they what? Unless they were hunting his steps, laying a trap, waiting to deceive. They said a trap. Now, personally, I personally believe that the adulterer was the man who may have been a Pharisee or a scribe very well. I, that's what I believe, okay? But one of the twain, whether the woman was married, which I don't think so, or the man who was married, who they don't mention, and they didn't bring him to Jesus. Regardless of who it was, one if the, of the twain, if not both the twain, were married, or else it would not specifically mention adultery. So someone, it was either the man, or it was either the woman. I don't think it was the woman. And we're going to look at this why, and we're going to see why, okay? We're going to see why. I personally believe that they brought this um, this woman who might have been a harlot or whatever, but they orchestrated something to bring it to pass, to bring her on to the Lord about adultery, okay? Uh, if she were married, the same principle. Maybe the Pharisee wasn't married. We do not know. Like I said, one of the twain, if not both the twain, were married. Adultery happened. We know that because that's what it says. Okay? So, adultery happened. Whether it was the woman, which I personally don't think it was, or if it was the man who I believe might have been either a Pharisee or a scribe was married, okay? We do not know. But adultery did happen. Absolutely. And looking at verse 5. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Okay? What sayest thou? Uh, first of all, go to Exodus chapter 20. Okay? We're going to look at the prohibition out of the Ten Commandments about adultery. Very simple, just one verse. Okay? Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay? You're married. You have relations with someone outside the married, married bed, and you are married, that is adultery. Okay? You cheat on your spouse, that's adultery. You're not married and have relations with people, that's fornication. Okay? But, the scripture says in Exodus 20, verse 14, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Plain and simple, right? Now go to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus Chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. Where, where, where is this? Okay. Beg your pardon, brethren. Leviticus chapter 20. Verse, uh, verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So, the adulterer and the adulteress. And right here it says, and the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife. Does that mean that this woman was married? I don't think so. I don't know. Could she have been? Absolutely. One of, one of these two, if not the woman or the man or both of them, someone was married. Okay? But, we're looking at this, and the man that committeth adultery, Leviticus 20, verse 10, with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. 
And some would like to argue, it's like, well, if the guy who's married has an affair with someone, uh, you know, who isn't married, I'm like, just shut up. That's still adultery, <laughs> okay? The one who is married is betraying, breaking the sanctity of the marriage bed by laying with someone else. He's joining himself to someone else. The two will be one flesh, okay? That's adultery. And under the law, definitely would have been murdered. Not murdered, put to death, excuse me, okay? So yes, this woman deserved to die. Absolutely she did. Absolutely she did. Now let's continue in John chapter 8. Verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Now, look at this. But, Je but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. This is uh, one of only two occurrences in the entirety of Scripture where our Lord Jesus Christ, God, who is our Father, wrote anything with his finger. Okay, because look at that, verse 6. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. With his finger. This is one of two. You, you might be saying, well, one of two. As far as I know, this is the only time that Jesus wrote anything. Oh, then you must be a Trinitarian, huh? Because God the Father, he wrote something with his finger. Yes, he did. Uh, Leviticus chapter 31, verse 18. Leviticus chapter 31, verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him, upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. See, Jesus Christ is God the Father. But see, Trinitarians say that Jesus is the second person of a three-person Trinity. That's satanic blasphemy. That's heresy. That's from Satan himself. That's devilish. Demonic. Demonic is not in scripture. Excuse me. That's devilish. Beg your pardon for that. Okay. Demonic. Beg your pardon. Okay. The Trinity is satanic. So when you see Jesus here writing with his finger in verse 6, um, because remember Trinitarians? Well, God the Father was God pretty primarily in the Old Testament. Then he gives his son uh, so, one of two gods, right? No, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament because there is one God comprised of spirit, soul, and body. So, God the Father, on two occasions, wrote with his finger. Uh, here in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, and here in John chapter 8, verse 6. Now, let's read verse 7. So, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them. Now picture this. He's writing on the ground. Like I said, one of only two times that God our Father wrote anything with his own finger. Okay? With the, with the finger of God, with his own finger. Okay? Yes, God used man to write the scripture. But see, the scriptures are given by inspiration. This is God's word. Okay? God used man's hand to write these Perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration scriptures. Yes, he did. But when it came to the Ten Commandments, with his own finger, as we just read in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, he wrote with his own finger. And Jesus here is writing on the ground again. Hmm. One of only two times. Let's continue. So when they continued to ask him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. What did Jesus do right here? He put his finger right on the right on it. Because see in verse 6, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. And we already looked at some verses of Scripture that talk about these people who lay traps. Okay? Jesus called them on it. He, he didn't even answer the thing that they brought to him about the woman in adultery. Why? Because they did it in deception. Yes, adultery was committed there. Obviously, 
Because it says so here in the scripture. Okay? But also, too, in looking at verse 7, picture this. These guys are, are harassing him, basically. He knows what they did. They know that they, he knows that they set a trap for him. And he was writing on the ground. Verse 8. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. What did he write? We don't know what he wrote. We do not know what he wrote. There are some out there, and I'm one of these, who believe that he wrote on the ground the Ten Commandments. Um, that's that's what I personally believe. That what was he? Because if if he wanted us to specifically know what he was writing on the ground, he would have said it in the scriptures. Okay, number one. But number two, it kind of makes sense that he was writing the Ten Commandments on the ground because he already had written the Ten Commandments on stone and given them to Moses. And here come these scribes and Pharisees and deceit trying to set a trap to trap God the Father. And he ignored them and kept writing on the ground. And then he lifts himself up, kind of like, <coughs> oy vey. Picture it. It's like they're, they're trapping him. God the Father knows. He's writing, uh, I believe, the Ten Commandments there, you know. And he's like, <laughs> he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Then like, kind of like, go away, you guys. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Look at verse 9. And they which heard it, heard what? He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, we should have known better, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the mist. So Jesus gave them the rebuke. He that is without sin because they came to him in sin. While this woman committed adultery, whether she was married or the guy were married or they both were married, some adultery was committed there. But see, it was a trap all along. And that is what Jesus uh, um God on him for, because he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Let us do evil that good may come, and good to these guys would have been to get rid of Jesus. Okay? And they which heard it, heard his rebuke, being convicted by their own conscience, maybe because of what he had written on the ground, he rebuked them and he wrote on the ground so they could see the Ten Commandments. And then it says, being convicted by their own conscience, because that's the purpose of the law, the Ten Commandments, to show you that you're a sinner, that you're not good. Okay? What was the purpose of the law? Okay? What was the purpose of the law? To show you that you're a no good rotten sinner, that you can't save yourself and that you couldn't keep God's perfect commandments even at your best. Even if you tried at gunpoint, you couldn't do it. So yes, I believe personally that what Jesus was writing there on the ground were the Ten Commandments. Can I prove that to you? No. Makes sense? No, a little bit. <laughs> but like I said, if he wanted us to know exactly what he was writing, he would have told us. But like I said, I personally believe that he had, he had written out the Ten Commandments because of verse 9. And they which heard it, his rebuke, being convicted by their own conscience, which was the intent of the law to convict you, okay, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, who would have known, even on to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman in, standing in the mist. Verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? 
hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, looking at verse 11, she said, unto, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Beg your pardon. Psalm 51. Come on, fingers, work with me, not against me. Psalm 51, verses 16 on to verse 17. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. This woman, this woman, look at verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Do you think this woman was broken? She was caught in the act of adultery, brought to the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, with the people intending to stone Jesus, using her as bait. She was afraid for her life, do you think? Yeah. And under the law, she deserved to die. So did the guy, but you don't see anything mentioned about the guy. Why is that? Because it was a trap. It was a trap. Because it was probably a Pharisee or a Sadducee. And they couldn't well bring him to Jesus, could they? Or else it would make them look bad. So they went after the woman, like Satan does constantly. Okay? Verse 16 and 17 in Psalm 51 again. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. See, under the law, they did animal sacrifices to cover sin. And we're going to look at that, just so you know. We're going to look in Leviticus chapter 17 about this. We're going to, we're going to get into go and sin no more, even though I've covered that in several videos before. We're going to get into that. But God delighteth in mercy. Go to Hosea chapter 6. A couple of one-verse references here. Hosea chapter 6. Daniel, Hosea, okay? Daniel is after uh, Ezekiel, if you do not know, okay? Hosea chapter 6, one verse, verse 6. Oh, you know what? Let's read verses 4 under verse 6, okay? O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away, your goodness. Yeah. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. Verse 9 in John chapter 8. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. Yeah. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. God is known by the judgment that he executeth here. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. 
Oh, these five uh, scribes and Pharisees, they, they had some head knowledge. But their hearts were far from him. Far from him. Well, look, they were trying to trap God. <laughs> Big part. And Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. Micah, just so you know, is after the book of Jonah. Okay? Micah chapter 7. One verse again. Micah chapter 7. Verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. See, God, you know, in Ezekiel chapter 18... Or he says, I have no pleasure that the wicked perish, but that they repent. Okay? God would much rather be merciful. But because people have rejected him, because of his holiness, because of his pureness, because he cannot look upon sin, um, he has no choice but to bring forth his judgment upon a wicked world. Upon you, a wicked sinner. See? He is known by the judgment that he executed. He would much rather be merciful. But if you mess around with the Lord, you're a child of wrath. Now, looking at verse 11 again. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go. And sin no more. Go and sin no more. Oh, wow. There are a lot of heretics out there who really, really take that go and sin no more and really twist it and just, oh, okay? For example, go and sin no more. People like that heretic Ray Comfort and that heretic Paul Washer, who basically, a lot of people go to this to preach um, sinless perfection that uh, John Boshoff Final Call 07 who's rotten in hell right now okay he used to say uh, you got to stop from sinning and Paul Washer and Ray Comfort both teach that you got to stop sinning then come to the Lord and he save you that that's that's true lordship salvation you could never give up your sins and then come to the Lord and get... It doesn't work like that. You can give up your sins if you try. You can give up your sins even at gunpoint. Hey, even this satanic, Jesuit, coadjutor, devil, easy believism, heretic scumbags that they are, even they will be uh, ones to be against sinless perfectionism. Okay? Sinless perfectionism today is impossible. You cannot be sinless. In standing with the Lord, yes, because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth away all sin. But see, our body and soul are housed within this skin suit. And the, sin, uh, the skin suit is sinful. Okay? The flesh is sinful. But see, it says, go and sin no more. Why did he say that? Why did he say that? Well, first of all, first of all, and, and people, like I said, Ray Comfort, don't watch that guy. He's a heretic. Okay, uh, Paul Washer, he's a heretic. These people who preach, you got to stop sinning. I don't sin anymore. <laughs> well, you just called God a liar and you're lying. Okay, you're lying. You broke it right there. You're, okay, you're in sin. You lied. Lying is sin. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. I don't sin anymore. <laughs> uh, what's, uh, what's the main thing here? Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. My fingers will get there. Ay, 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 all right. Thank you, pardon, brother. Okay. 2 Timothy chapter 2. What's going on here? Where he says to this woman, go and sin no more. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to shew thyself approved unto God. 
A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What does that mean? Had our Lord Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures yet? Hmm? Come on. Did he? No, he did not. No, he did not. What does this mean? Doctrinally, this is still under the law. Because the perfect sacrifice for sin had not yet been made. So, the new dispensation that we are in today, the time of the Gentiles, began with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It began with the death of the testator. Okay? Okay? You read Hebrews chapter 9. Okay? And Hebrews chapter 10. Okay? Hebrews chapter 9. Excuse me. It's Hebrews chapter 9. We're, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 9 too, by the way. Okay? But you read Hebrews chapter 9. The New Testament began with the death of of the testator okay not with the birth so doctrinally doctrinally this is still under the law the law was still binding okay go to colossians colossians chapter 2 colossians chapter 2 i'm going to be visiting colossians on two occasions Go and sin no more. I've covered this in other videos, but for the sake of uh, right now, we're going to cover it again, okay? Colossians chapter 2. Let us read verses 8 on to verse 15. Uh, we're reading verse 8 specifically because you've got these heretic devils out there. And hey, even these uh, coadjutor Jesuit devils uh, who are easy believism heretics, these devils, even they are swift to get on to these people who preach uh, sinless perfection. That there's no such thing. Okay, that doesn't mean that it, what, you know that the easy believism devils are are right or anything. But no, you know the suspension of disbelief they got to keep up to make people think that they're actually saved of the Church of the Living God while they're Christians. But this is what people who come to go and sin no more. So you got to stop sinning, right? This is a different dispensation. It was still under the law. What's, what's going on here? This is what these people who do to you, who say, talk to you about, you got to stop sinning and you can't sin anymore. And if you sin, then you lose your salvation. Okay. Beware. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy, the wisdom of men, and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, Catholics, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Spirit, soul, and body. God is spirit, soul, and body. Okay? We're made in the image of man, um, in the image of God. We have a spirit, soul, and body. One God comprised of spirit, soul, and body. The Godhead, not the Trinity. The Trinity tells you that there are three persons. A person is a spirit, soul, and body that make one God. So they're saying that three gods make one. No. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one, spirit, soul, and body. Okay? For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. God's in control of everything. Okay? The government that we have is ordained of, of, of God, yes. Ordained for what? Destruction of America and for judgment upon a wicked nation. Okay? And whatever nation you're in. Okay? Australia? Yeah, unfortunately, yes, your government is ordained of God for judgment against your nation. Yes. Yes. And Satan is playing that, all that up. He's like, oh, I'm going to pick the worst of the worst because God is allowing me to do that for judgment against these people. 
Okay. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Where, where did I say the verse 15? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. See, the law was there to make you aware of sin that you couldn't save yourself even if you tried. You at your best cannot keep the perfect requirements, which the Ten Commandments are. You cannot keep God's perfect requirements at all. You can't do it. If you break one of them, you've broken them all. You can't do it. Only God could do what he what he gave unto man, his perfect commandments, his perfect requirements. Only God could do that because God is perfect and cannot sin. Okay? And see, under the Old Testament, it says here that circumcision may... Have, look at verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. What is this circumcision made without hands? What is that? First of all, now, go to Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. And here's where, here's the crux of the Catholic who worships a little round cookie, who worships flesh. Okay? Romans chapter 8, verses 1 on to verse 4. Okay? Circumcision made without hands. Therefore, Romans 8, verses 1 on to verse 4. Therefore, there now, therefore is there. There is, beg your pardon, therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Because the law was there for evildoers, to show you that you cannot save yourself, that you cannot keep God's perfect requirements. That's what the law was there for, to show you your need to be saved, okay? That you could not do what God required of you perfectly. You couldn't do it. That's why you need him, okay? For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Truly the spirit is willing, but the flesh, the skin suit, is weak, okay? Okay? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, you know, the little round wafer cookie, okay? But after the spirit. So, verse 3 specifically tells us what? Flesh is sinful, and sin has been condemned to the flesh. See, when Satan tempted God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, God cannot be tempted to do evil. So, Satan was tempting what? The flesh that was sinful. You ready for this one? I've said this before many times, but I'm going to say it again. The flesh of Jesus Christ, Catholic, you're going to love this. Uh, the flesh of Jesus Christ was sinful. Yeah, that's what Satan tempted because God himself, it's remember, okay, you idiot, you Catholic, okay, I'm talking to a specific individual, you know who you are, okay. Um, 
Satan's temptation was to the flesh. God cannot sin. Thank you, partner. I dropped my glasses. Okay. God cannot sin. So Satan's temptation, because remember, in Matthew chapter 16, Satan values the things that be of men and not of God, and man is what? Flesh. Okay? Okay? Hmm. So, Jesus' flesh, it was the Word made flesh. The flesh doesn't sanctify us. The flesh doesn't save us. Okay? It's the blood that washes away our sin. And he himself said the flesh profiteth, profiteth nothing. So the flesh of Jesus was actually sinful. But yet God never sinned. He can't sin. But see, in that his flesh was sinful, he was tempted because of the flesh. But yet he never sinned. See, it's very easy to... Uh, Figure that out, especially when you put into the equation Romans chapter 8, verses 1 on to verse 4. Okay? All right? But the circumcision made without hands, go back now to Colossians chapter 1. What is the circumcision made without hands? What is the circumcision made without hands? Colossians chapter 1, verses 23 on to verse 29. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, the church of the living God. He cannot deny himself, as it says in First Timothy, or Second Timothy, excuse me, okay? We are of his bones, of his flesh. We are the body of Christ, okay? Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, this current dispensation, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest. What is that mystery? That us Gentiles are grafted into the tree of the Jew. But to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. He just tells you right there what the mystery is. Which is Christ. In you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The circumcision made without hands. That, what is that? The circumcision? That's Christ in you. Okay? As it says in Ephesians, I've read this, I read this in the last video. I'm going to read it again. Okay? As it says right here, in Ephesians chapter 1, okay, verses 13 on to verse 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and how shall they hear unless one is sent unto them who is a preacher? Okay, but, okay, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, uh, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The gospel of your salvation, Christ Jesus died, buried, and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, okay? In whom also after that ye believe, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, unto the praise of his glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, the Lord is that Spirit. And Jesus Christ just happens to be God the Father. So that circumcision made without hands is Christ in you. And I, I, we have to. One of, my, one of my favorite portions of Scripture, Galatians, Chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, of course. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, something that you do in the flesh, then Christ is dead in vain. Absolutely. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. See, again, under the law. Under the law. Okay, dear friend. The Holy Ghost was not a permanent residence. See, the circumcision made in the flesh was a sign of the covenant. Okay? And it was a sign given unto the Jews, those who would be under the covenant to keep the whole law. Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians. Okay? Okay? Um, our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled it. Fulfilled the ultimate. He paid the, he paid the price. The, he, paid for the, he was the sacrifice for sins. Because the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins, only cover them. See? But it was the blood of God who washes away our sins. Okay? And when you come to the Lord on His terms, His conditions, broken and contrite, as we already looked at in Psalm 51. Okay? Contrite. Sorry, it's your fault that He died. You're the reason Christ Jesus died. As I am the reason Christ Jesus died. Because of what you have done. Because of your sins. It's your fault. You don't like that, do you? It's your fault. It's your fault. See, another good thing you can uh, gauge people upon is how they handle things that are of their fault. Are they like Saul, like to deflect? It's like, okay, yeah, I messed up. But if you hadn't have done this, see, that's the old man, the Adamic nature. Yeah, I messed up. But if you hadn't have done this, uh, no, no. Yeah, I messed up. It's my fault. It's your fault. See, the repenting that you're doing, dear friend, Unlike what Mr. Washer and that weirdo with his dog, Ray Comfort, and many other people out there who are true lordship salvationists, um, the repenting that you are doing is of your self-righteousness. You could not give up your sins even if you tried. If you were held at gunpoint, you couldn't do it. The repenting that you are doing is of your self making of yourself your own God, because you're judging what is good and evil. That is what you are repenting of, yourself. You're not good. And then when it hits you, that it's your fault. And that God has every right and is just to cast you to hell. You know what that does? That scares the hell out of you. And because you have the hell scared out of you, you will call upon the name of the Lord. It just happens. But see, if you're not broken of your self-righteousness and in brokenness of self-righteousness, you are able to accept the fact that it's your fault. You caused him to die. Might as well have been your hands lashing our Lord. It might have been it might as well have been your hand that put the nail through his hands, not his wrists. Okay? Might as well have been you. Might as well have been me. Okay? Might as well have been me. And see, when you realize that, you will realize I'm going to hell. And God is just and right to send me there. That scares you. It's called the fear of the Lord, see. Don't fight that. See, the, this is why I'm so adamant against these easy believism pond scum. Because, see, they're too good. They're too full of themselves to call upon the name of the Lord. Why? Because they've never been broken of themselves and they have never had contrition, godly sorrow, for the fact that it's their fault that he died. 
But no, they want to climb up another way. Don't you? Just believe. That's why, that's why I'm constantly uh, attacking these devils. They'll attack me sooner or later again. You know, they go in cycles. Okay, they disappear and then they come back. You know, I'm on to that and I'm ready for you, by the way. Just so you know. Okay? <laughs> but, okay, that's why I'm always talking against these devils. Okay? Because they've never been broken of their self-righteousness. They've never had true godly sorrow knowing that it's their fault. It's your fault that he died. And they don't have the fear of the Lord. Fear of going to hell. It's not there in these people. Because they dispute against calling upon the name of the Lord. Repentance is going from unbelief to belief. Nonsense. And only, only saved people can have godly sorrow. See, that's devilish. That's satanic. That's Catholic. Okay? Which these coadjutor people are. They're all Catholics. Okay? A lot of them, I believe, are actual Jesuits. Others are Catholics working for the Jesuit order. Okay? But that's why I'm so against them. Because they're too full of themselves. They save themselves by their own belief. See? That's why I'm against them. But see, when you come to the Lord on his conditions and he save you, you are sealed with the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that spirit. You have Christ living within you, our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the circumcision made without hands. Okay? Now, what was different here when our Lord said this to this woman, go and sin no more. Why was that different? Go to Leviticus chapter 17. Often in the book of Leviticus, you will read uh, the phrase being cut off. Being cut off. Or, and you also read in Ezekiel, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Because, see, our Lord Jesus Christ, God within you, was not a permanent residence within the dispensation under the law. Okay, he could come and go, come and go. Okay, but let's go to Leviticus chapter 17. Okay, Leviticus chapter 17, not Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 17. We will begin at verse 10 and we will read until the end of the chapter. Actually, <laughs> Can you handle 16 verses? Let's begin. Let's read the whole chapter, shall we? Can you take this? Leviticus chapter 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel, that killeth any ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord. Blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. You've heard of sport hunting, where you see these weirdos who get these big head trophy heads, you know, on their walls. And hey, you kill an animal to get the meat to survive and you want to put its head on a wall. God bless you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it. But there are trophy hunters who hunt not for the meat, but just for a trophy. I personally believe that's what's being addressed here. Okay? That's what I believe is being addressed here. Okay? Because... The animals were there for the service of man and also for us to eat, okay? But there again, it was by the blood of bulls and goats that sin was covered, not washed away permanently, okay? Covered, not washed away. Don't worry, we're going to be reading in Hebrews here in a little bit, okay? But sport, trophy hunting, hunting for sustenance, and after you have hunted for your sustenance, you want to put the deer's head on a wall. Why? I, I don't get it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay? But I do believe our Lord is speaking against trophy hunting. There's no problem with hunting. We're probably going to have to do that. Can you skin something? I can. Can you? Okay? Let's continue. 
to the end that the children of Israel might bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto the Lord. So see, you know, God doesn't want people to just willy-nilly kill animals. Animals serve a purpose for our use, you know, to plow fields and to ride on a... You ever, you ever rode on a horse before? Okay? And also, you know, for meat, killing bulls and chickens and that kind of stuff, but also for sacrifices unto the Lord, okay? They had a specific purpose. You got some bozo just wanting to kill one just to get the head and not do anything with the meat for his own sustenance or for his family? No. Um, you guys out there who enjoy trophy hunting, I think truly the Lord is against what you do. If you're trophy hunting and eat, saving the meat, that's totally different. But if you're just killing to get a head, you know, like these guys who fish. You catch a fish only to let it go? Well, I, I, I've never understood that. I've, never, I've, I've seen that before. You know, guys will get these big fish. You know, it's like, whoa, that's going to taste good with some, some batter on it. Oh, or pan fry it with a little garlic. Oh, and then they let it go. It's like, ah! Oh, it's, it's the thrill of the hunt. That fish could have fed my whole family. Yeah. Let's continue. Sorry for that little rant. Verse 6. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils after whom they have gone a-whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. And thou shalt say unto them, Whoso, uh, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. Cut off from among his people. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, okay, Catholic, here you go, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. Before the law, under the law, and after the law. You have three occurrences where... Um, Drinking, eating blood is prohibited. Kind of rough for you, Catholic. Uh, now, okay, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the flesh that maketh atonement for the soul. Right, Catholic? No. It is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It's the blood, not the flesh. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof, and cover it with the dust. With dust, excuse me. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is in the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Cut off. And every soul, look at that. Are you looking at that? Don't look at me. And every soul that eateth that which dieth of itself. Every soul. A soul can eat. 
What's going on here? And every soul that eateth that which dieth of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. Then shall he be clean. But if he wash him not, nor bathe his flesh, he shall bear his iniquity. So looking at specifically at verse 15, and every soul that eateth that which dieth of itself, this means that body and soul under the law was connected, knit together. Why? Because that circumcision made without hands wasn't there. Okay? Even when our Lord indwelt a individual within the Old Testament, he was not a permanent resident. Okay? Not at all. Okay? I'll prove this to you. Back to Psalm 51. Okay? Back to Psalm 51. Okay? Body and soul were intrinsically connected. That's why you see the dietary restriction. Because what, if you ate something under the law, it would affect your soul because the circumcision made without hands wasn't there. Okay, God himself wasn't in you there uh, under the law permanently. You know, if they touched the dead body, the circumcision made without hands wasn't there. That would affect your soul because, again, the circumcision made without hands wasn't there. Okay, now that our Lord in this dispensation, when he saves you, permanently indwells you, seals you until the day of redemption, that's why you can eat meat. That's why you can eat pork. Okay. That, because the circumcision made without hands is there. It doesn't affect your soul as it did in the Old Testament, see. Okay? But Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verses 6 unto verse 11. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And also you read about King Saul, how the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. You also read about Samson when his locks got cut off that the Spirit of the Lord or the Lord departed from him. King Hezekiah, the Lord left him for a moment so he could, you know, to, so that Hezekiah would see, oh wow, I messed up when he boasted and showed the enemy everything that he had. Okay? Under the law, under the law, the Holy Spirit was not a permanent residence. There was no seal until the day of redemption under the law. That is for this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, specifically. You have to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. So, so when our Lord says to this woman, caught in the act of adultery, she said, no man, uh, uh, John chapter 8, verse 11, she said, no man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, because he delighteth in mercy. Go and sin no more. Because they were under the law still, because he had not made the perfect sacrifice for sins. So if she were to sin while under the law, it would affect her soul, because the circumcision made without hands wasn't there yet. That's why he said that. And see, you got a lot of people today, great comfort, Paul Washer and countless others who like to go to this and say, you got to stop. Even uh, Joker, Miss Joker, you know, uh, Joyce Myers, okay, Miss Joker, you know, you got to stop sinning. 
I didn't get through with my head that I wasn't a sinner or I'd stop sinning until whatever, whatever she said. I didn't stop sinning until I got through with my, my thick head. I wasn't a sinner anymore. Bravo! Good luck. See, people, they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. Someone who comes to this and tells you that today, go and sin no more. You got to stop sinning. Yeah, yeah, we are to avoid sin. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's what Romans chapter 6 is about. And then you read Romans chapter 7 about how the greatest of the church of the living God struggled with his sin. Okay? And his sin was pride. I'm talking about Paul, of course. Okay? Okay? See, you're going to sin. And yes, we got to do our best by abiding in Christ that we sin not. Okay, but see here when he said go and sin no more, it was because they were under the law and anything she did because the circumcision made without hands wasn't there, anything she would do affected her soul directly. Whereas the circumcision made without hands, we can touch a dead body. We can eat these things, okay? And it won't affect our soul. Why? Because the circumcision made without hands wasn't there. You have to rightly divide the word of truth there, friend, or else you're going to have all kinds of problems. This was said to a woman under the law. Okay? You have to remember that. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And we'll be done. Rather a uh, shorter video today. Hebrews chapter 9. You ready for this? Uh, verses 1 on to, oh, let's read. Oh. Hmm. To verse 17. Can you handle this? Let's go. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 on to verse 17. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Remember, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. You're saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if any man defile the temple of God, any man, lost people, saved people, yourself, Okay, if any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. Okay, and you're only the temple of God if God lives within you. Okay, but let's continue. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shewbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. That was the content of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot speak, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, but into the second went the high priest alone once a year on uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God our Father, the Holy Ghost. This signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Why? Because it was a different dispensation. Well, as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, Look at, don't look at me. Look at that verse. That could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. See, a lot of these heretics like Washer and Ray Comfort, 
you know, that great comfort. But what about holiness? What about holiness? And Paul Washer talking about, see, to them, holiness is sinful, is uh, sinless perfection. Scripturally, holiness is being set apart, being other than that. Okay? Holiness is separation, not sinless perfection. Okay? Holiness, you know, God is holy. Yeah, he's separate. He can't sin. When it comes to you and me, uh, we being holy, that means we're separate than that. Not that we're sinless. Okay? We are saved sinners. You're going to sin no matter what. Why? Because your spirit and soul are housed in the skin suit. And the skin suit is the sin suit. Okay? Sin has been condemned in the flesh. As long as your spirit and soul are in the sin suit, <laughs> you're going to sin. Okay? Don't fall for these heretics like Ray Comfort and Paul Washer. Okay? Don't fall for these devils. These sinless perfectionist twits. Okay? Please. Oh, then we can say... Shh, I'm going to put a video about uh, Romans chapter 6. Okay? Talked about that before at length. So, let's continue. But it says here that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Why? Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal fleshly ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Not the Protestant Reformation. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not with hands, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own flesh, he, <clears throat> excuse me, see how ridiculous that is, you Catholic, but by his own blood, he entered in once, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What does that mean? See, when he talks about being perfect toward the Lord, that our conscience being perfect, our hearts are perfect. A broken heart, a contrite spirit, a broken heart is a heart that belongs unto God. Okay? A heart that is broken that is contrite, that fears him, that is a heart that belongs unto God. Thence, hence, that is a heart that is perfect. Okay? Not sinlessly perfect. You can't be sinlessly perfect today. It's impossible. If you say you don't sin anymore, you're a liar. The Lord rebuke you. Okay? The Lord rebuke you. If you say, I don't sin anymore. I don't sin anymore. You're a liar. You just sin. Go away. Lord rebuke you, the wicked heretic. Okay? But see, being perfect with God is pertaining to what? The conscience. Because they had to continually do these animal sacrifices, which were not objects of faith. You idiots! Oh! Everybody's favorite YouTube Jesuit says that. Oh, they, they were just objects of faith. No, they weren't. They had to... Uh, Offer sacrifices for their sins. The blood of bulls and goats, which covered sins. Didn't wash them away. We just kind of looked at it. Okay? The blood of Jesus Christ washes away sin, while the blood of bulls and goats just covered it. So they had to continually offer those animal sacrifices because that blood just covered where the blood of Jesus Christ, God our Father, took it away. 
Okay, that doesn't mean that you're not going to sin anymore. Of course not. But that means that there's no more sacrifice for sins. You go to him in repentance when you are of the church of the living God and you have sinned. You know, yeah, it's like, Lord, I'm, please forgive me, I've sinned. I repent, you know, yes. But you don't have to, there's no more sacrifice for sins because the one and only perfect sacrifice for sin, God himself, the blood of God, paid for your sins. Okay? You get it? Let's continue. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. You know how the children of Israel in the Torah, the first five books, they went into the promised land, but Moses died before they went into the promised land. Okay? The death of the testator. Okay? Moses died. Joshua led them into the promised land. Okay? It's a type. Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Brings in the New Testament, this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles that we are in right now. You have to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. Again, this book is for you. It's not written, it's not all written to you. Beg your pardon. Okay? Yes, scriptures are for you. Yes, it's not all written to you. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. Be dispensational. Or else you're going to fall for people like Ray Comfort, Paul Washer, and countless other people who say you got to stop sinning, you can't sin anymore, or else you lose your salvation like Paul Washer implies greatly that you lose your salvation and then you got to get it back again and stuff like that. Also like Ray Comfort, okay? Yeah. You have eternal security as long as you're abiding in him. That's Calvinism. See, Paul Washer, by the way, is a true Calvinist who is also a lordship salvationist. Interesting. Let's continue. Let's finish this up. Verse 17. For a testament is, is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is no, of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So see, Moses died, and then Joshua brought the children of Israel over to the promised land and established, you know, the Old Testament. Okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ, he died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Shed his blood on the cross that cleanseth us away, cleanseth away all sin. Okay? That brought in the New Testament. The New Testament didn't begin with the birth of Jesus Christ. It began with his death, which ushered in this dispensation that you and I are currently in. Okay? So when our Lord says to this woman, go and sin no more, that's what he meant. Because they were under the law. And anything she did while under the law, any sin, would directly affect our soul. Uh, uh, directly affect the soul. Okay? Today, you as the church of the living God, you can do any kind of sin there is, unfortunately. Why you would, I don't know. Uh, have you quenched the spirit? But see, any sin you commit as the church of the living God, yes, God, God will forgive you. But see, here's the thing. Does... What our Lord Jesus Christ, what he did for you, Church of the Living God. All you of the Church of the Living God, I'm not talking about you wicked, devil, heretic, satanic Jesuits who like to justify sin. I'm talking to you of the Church of the Living God. Does our Lord's honor, does our Lord who died for you and cleansed you, who dwells within you, 
mean anything to you? You say, well, of course, Brad. Then why continue in sin as to bring shame upon him? See, that's the thing. Easy believism devils want to make you comfortable in your sin. They have no shame. You and I as a church of the living God, we have shame when we sin against our Lord. Because, yeah, okay, you're going to go to heaven when you die. If you're truly saved, born again, converted, and a new creature. But is our Lord going to let you in ashamed of you? Or are you going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Which one is it going to be? I don't know about you. But I don't want to incur the shame of having my Lord, my, of having my Lord being ashamed of me as he lets me in to heaven. So, so brother, uh, no, the scribes and Pharisees did not make it up about the woman caught in adultery. Adultery was committed somewhere, okay? If it was either or or both of them, adultery was committed. So, no, it was not. No, they didn't make it up. They concocted it so they could find a reason to stone Jesus. That is how I will answer that question. Hopefully that helps, brother. I'm sorry it took so long to, uh, to make this, to respond to you. Um, to all of you who send me emails. <laughs> wow. Takes my breath away sometimes. I am your servant. But I also am servant unto my wife. Who at this present time needs her husband. So, if you have sent me an email and I have not responded to you or if I have not gotten to your question or have not done or I have gotten... I've got, this makes now seven. Uh, there was a total of eight videos that are in the, ba uh, in the wings waiting to get done. Um, if I haven't gotten to your question, if I haven't gotten to your email yet, please have some grace. Please, okay? Please. I am your servant. Yes. I am also a married man to a wife who needs me. So, please keep that in mind. And please have patience, patience with your servant, okay? So, anyway, that is going to be it for this particular video. There may be another video today. If not, there will be one coming within the next day or two. So, Thank you so much for watching this, if you do. Pray for one another, brethren. Pray for one another. Pray for the weak. Pray for the sick. Pray for our brethren in Australia. Pray for the babes. Please keep us in your prayer. We need it. We need you. We need our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, in every aspect. We love you. We will see you in the next video, okay?